tradition has a rhythm. It provides a backbeat. And tradition is constantly changing and subject to all sorts of different factors, but there are certain key features that continue from generation to generation. It has to do with place, material, uh, technique, equipment, and, and to a certain extent, uh, style. Particular regions have distinctive aesthetic uh, uh, features within their traditions. Potters are in this part of the country because there's good clay here. And they manage to survive here because of a variety of historical, economic, and cultural reasons. But uh, the foundation is the clay. This place makes for a really interesting place to be a potter, especially a British-born potter. I've found essentially the ceramic equivalent of the blues and bluegrass and jazz here uh, in ceramic form. I'm gonna put a, a top on this just to flare it out. My family was involved in industrial ceramics in England. As a young adult, I was given a, a famous book by the great English studio potter Bernard Leach. All right. I looked at those parts and was captivated. What I've done for the last 20 years here in North Carolina is I make new work out of the old through kind of passionate research. Okay. The old potters noticed that one of a handle was cracked when they put it in when they put a pot into the kiln and they placed a scrap of glass across the handle to secure it during the firing. And of course they noticed that it was a really pretty decorative element once they saw how the glass ran. They started doing it purely ornamentally. The North Carolina tradition was they were farmer potters. They would pot in the wintertime when they couldn't farm, and in the summer they'd grow vegetables. They were terrific potters making ornate and plain utilitarian wares. What's fascinating about North Carolina's more recent ceramic history is that a transition was made from that utilitarian tradition, supplying farms, to a more craft-based um, artware tradition during the 1920s and 30s. Jugtown pottery had a key role to play in that transition, and the Busbys who founded Jugtown recognized that the utilitarian pots were no longer in demand, but the skills were still there to make a different type of ware for a different type of customer. Do you think I should put this lid here under the salt hole or not? If I had a couple of little pieces to put over here, uh, then I think we'd be ready for the frog skin. People really make a connection with Jugtown when they come in because they, you know, they have, it's, it's, it's not just a store you walk up to, it's a whole place, it's an experience. And, and there's not many places like this left. First potters came in this area uh, about 1750 or something in that range. There been some old kill sites found and they, they went back and, and figured out how the kills was built. The groundhog like we use now, Pretty much this version, it may vary some, you know, but this pretty much this version of it is uh, the ones that's been being used since like uh, uh, 1850 in that range, I'm sure. You don't over expect fire move woods. You just don't build that thing up to where you say, I know I've got it this time. This is going to be great. You know, you don't ever do that. Well, 
I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. Really, the minute I went into the pottery, I was just very sure I was going to be making pottery for the rest of my life. My love of pottery was a love of very simple pots, very uh, connected, utilitarian pots. So to come to Jugtown was just a, a phenomenal experience, to come down to a pottery that had a direct link to pottery being made here for, you know, just hundreds of years. And when I got to Jugtown, there was the wood kiln. There, were, there was Vernon making pots, and watching Vernon making pots is kind of like watching someone breathe. They just happen. To my daddy and, and uh, a lot of the other potters around here, there wasn't nothing magical about it. It's just a way for them to make a living. And, and so that's the way I grew up. My daddy had brothers several years older than he was. And that's the way he learned to make pottery, working with his brothers. He had stories he told about how they burned it and where they got their clay and how they fixed their clay and which one of them was very serious about the pottery and which one was just sort of, oh, I'll just make it anyway, you know, it don't matter. We call this glaze tobacco spit. It's, uh, it's not the original old tobacco spit, but uh, the old tobacco spit was lead glaze, you know, and that's what Jugtown was founded on. I do all the mixing of glazes and put them on. This has been my job through the years, you know. They make the pots and then I start taking care of them down here, you know. Well, me and Vernon's been here the same amount of time, and it's, I think it's 48 years. We've done everything together, it seemed like, you know. We both like, like the pottery a lot. And we, both of us, like cars and motorcycles. We love the motorcycles, you know. Our family goes back, potters for, Travis is the fourth generation, I believe. Well, I started making pots as soon as I could get down to the shop. You know, I just grew up watching my parents work, so it just seemed natural for me to, as soon as I could get down there and they'd let me, I would make pots. Most kids played or watched television or something, but I came down to the shop and worked. Travis has been fooling with it since he was about two weeks old. Pam would bring him in the shop where she was working, and we had a big wooden oak basket, and that's where he lay. He actually pretty much grew up in the room where he makes pots in now. I always knew from the time I was small that that's what I was going to do. And I always told everybody, I said, yeah, I'm just going to make pottery when I grow up. I came here in the fall of 1968. I was just aghast at this enclave in here. The trees and the log buildings just grabbed me right away. When I came here, Vernon and Bob were, they had tremendous knowledge of the salting, firing with wood, where to get the clays and what the clays would do. Vernon, told me very frankly when I asked him if he and Bob would work with me 
I mean, I'm a stranger from the north. I'm a damn Yankee. Vernon said, yes, if we, if we get our pay every week. First time we don't get it, we leave. I gulped because money was fairly short. Well, one of the first things I remember about coming here was the running out of water. First thing happened, the well went dry. Absolutely. So we had to, guys had to haul water every day so we could chink the holes in this house <laughs> and rebuild the kilns. Yeah. Mm. But it didn't take long to get a whale drill. Well, I assume the kill you're going to unload this afternoon is the second of the salt glaze firing. I get a pretty neat feeling when I hold pots that were made around here like 150 years ago. And I know what those people went through. I know that they had to dig the clay and it was all, every, everything was hand done. It was turned on a kick wheel and they had to cut their wood for the keel. Sometimes I pick up those pots and I wonder how in the world they did it. Jugtown was started by this couple from Raleigh who came to the area and saw the wonderful pots and saw the tradition kind of falling off. The Busby aesthetic, I call it, is just, it is a wonderful aesthetic based on some wonderful pots. Juliana was a photographer and Jacques was a painter uh, from Raleigh. And they traveled down here together and began to think that what their life's work ought to be is preserving North Carolina traditional pottery. They'd seen some pretty wonderful pottery from long Asian traditions, and, and they also loved the North Carolina very simple utilitarian wares. They kind of brought both of those together, and I think that's the interesting thing about Jugtown. It's got a really strong base of North Carolina which has come down through the different potters that have worked here, and it's always gotten uh, sort of an infusion of traditions, long pottery traditions from the world. Day three. It's easy. As Elliot said, no artist has his complete meaning alone. And your forebears provide you the history that propels you forward. Now, the best mechanism, in my opinion, for conveying the tradition forward is through family. And down at Jugtown, the conveyance is from Vernon to Travis. And Travis will learn things that nobody else could possibly know about a lifetime's worth of potting that Vernon himself learnt from his father, and so on back. That one there, I like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. That's a, that's a prescription that's right there. Skin. Really that's nice. It's got a nice ash run right there, isn't that pretty? Oh yes, oh lovely. Being able to make a, a simple pot and have it be beautiful is a goal that we all have at Jugtown. It doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be honed down and simple. And of course, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of decoration, sometimes there's not, but it's um, the simplicity of a, a well-made pot with a continuous line flowing that we strive for. From the time I was, you know, eight or nine, I could give people a, a history of the place. And, and that, I think it surprised a lot of people that I, I would take it that seriously, but it was always something that I was really into. Travis is the future and the tradition. He's going to be it for this place. Jugtown's where I belong. I really prefer to be working here than anywhere else I've ever been or anything else I've ever tried, so it's good. <laughs>